On July 16, 1945, the nuclear age began on this spot in the New Mexico desert. This is Trinity site. In the four decades since Trinity, we have lived with nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, and nuclear medicine. Those things have touched all our lives. But there's also an unseen danger, the danger of nuclear terrorism. In the past nine years, many American cities have been threatened by people who claim to have either stolen or built their own nuclear weapons. Tonight, for the first time, we'll tell you about those threats. And we'll also tell you about a secret team of scientists who may have the most dangerous job in history, the job of finding and disarming such devices. This is the story of NEST, the Nuclear Emergency Search Team. Our story begins 2,000 miles from this place in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, on a spring day in 1974. Boston woke up that morning to a day which promised an early spring. The Boston Bruins had made the hockey finals, and the newspaper headlines were filled with Richard Nixon's problems over an incident called Watergate. At the Colonial Theater downtown, Henry Fonda was starring in a one-man play about the life of Clarence Darrow. The people of Boston were doing what they did on any normal day, but this day was anything but normal. At the new city hall building and across town of police headquarters, two letters were being delivered. Letters which would send shock waves all the way from Boston to the Oval Office in the White House. Those letters threatened the city with the explosion of a 500 kiloton plutonium bomb, five times as powerful as the weapon which leveled Hiroshima 23 years earlier. The letters warned that the bomb would be detonated at midnight on May 4th unless the city paid a ransom of $200,000 and delivered two airline tickets to Rome. The first incident had begun. One of the letters was turned over to me as the deputy superintendent in charge of the intelligence division at the time to coordinate an investigation with uh, the members of the FBI and the state police if needed to uh, try to bring this extortionate demand to a head. We didn't know whether there was anybody in this area that had the capability of making such a device. And if so, uh, I don't think we gave much uh, thought to uh, what would happen if it blew. If, it, uh, if somebody did have it and it blew up, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about it anyway. The FBI, however, was worried about the threat, and they notified the White House. The president's national security advisors turned for help to the only people with the expertise to handle such a threat, the people who were designing and building nuclear weapons for America's defense arsenal. General Malin Gates headed the center which finds out if those weapons work. The center is called the Nevada Test Site. The thing that did not exist, even though there was a capability to detect equipment, there was no uh, central point of control, uh, no procedures outlined for communication, for transportation, for logistic support, for organization of the search party, and that kind of thing. We put it together in one heck of a hurry and responded to that threat. But the response was uh, only after a lot of trauma uh, between Washington and my office in trying to get straightened out as to who was going to do what. So now the fate of over two million people was in the hands of the Boston Police Department, the FBI, and the Atomic Energy Commission. The people of Boston had no idea about the drama being played out in the quiet suburb of Brighton, not far from the center of town. The FBI put together a package to be left in front of this house, as the extortionists demanded. But they didn't fill it with money. They filled it with paper and placed it under a bush. Surveillance teams moved into the houses across the street. Police settled into unmarked cars around the corner, and sniper teams raced into position on nearby rooftops. And they watched, and they waited. While that was going on, a team of volunteer scientists was hastily assembled to come to Boston to handle the device, if it proved to be real. Well, the government learned some valuable lessons in logistics on that trip. 
team of scientists flew here to New York's JFK Airport by commercial airliner. Their equipment was flown by military aircraft to a staging area near Rome Air Force Base in upstate New York. The commercial airline lost the scientists' luggage. And when an Air Force jet was dispatched to pick them up here, they found the scientists had already gone. They chartered their own bus to take them all the way to Boston. We uh, were completely new at the uh, problem of nuclear devices and how large a device would have to be. I think we learned at that time from through the Bureau and probably from Washington that the device would have to be the size of a good-sized executive desk. And it's a rather cumbersome thing to move around, and it would be very heavy. It uh, was eventually uh, passed off as a hoax when uh, nothing ever developed. We staked out the area all day and waited for somebody to show after putting the suitcase under the bush, and uh, nobody ever showed up. We never had any further contact, and uh, it uh, was just passed off as a, as a, as a bomb hoax, and uh, nothing further was done. But something was done. In August, three months later, America had a new president, Gerald Ford. And a review of the problems faced in handling the Boston hoax indicated some system would have to be devised to deal with such threats in the future. Ford was not alone with that concern. I w went to the headquarters and said, hey, we, we can't afford to do that. Uh, we need to have a refined program, and I hereby request that you give me a program, and I suggest that you ask me to do these things. That occurred in November of that year, and that was the birth of Nuclear Emergency Search Team, NET. What began with those two letters in Boston has grown enormously over the past nine years. And the challenges for the Nuclear Emergency Search Team have grown both in number and in danger. Twelve months after the Boston incident, it happened again, this time here in New York City. An extortionist demanded $30 million in small bills, unmarked and out of sequence, from 12 Federal Reserve banks, or else he threatened to make the island of Manhattan disappear. The drawing which accompanied that note was sophisticated, precise, and was obviously made by someone with more than a passing knowledge of nuclear physics. Once again, a ransom package was prepared. Once again, it was never picked up. And once again, no one was ever arrested or charged with the extortion threat. No one knows why, but 1974 and 75 were banner years for nuclear extortion threats in this country. None of them was ever made public. But in San Francisco, Spokane, Chicago, and other cities, someone decided to threaten those cities with the detonation of a homemade nuclear weapon. Each time a threat occurred, it put more pressure on the experts who were building NEST to answer the challenge. There was in existence at the time a capability in our laboratory for detecting radioactivity. Obviously, they had to have that capability because we worked with radioactive material all the time. Uh, some of the capability that they had evolved from two accidents that had occurred in years prior to 1974 one in Palomares, Spain, and one in Thule, Greenland. And because of that, the development of the uh, radiation detection equipment had proceeded perhaps at a more rapid pace than it would have otherwise. One of their biggest problems was not scientific, it was political. NEST was still so secret that even Congress knew nothing of its existence until two years after its organization. The first public knowledge came after closed-door congressional hearings in March of 1977, before the House Armed Services Committee. A press release was quickly prepared by the Energy Research and Development Agency, but it was only given out reluctantly upon request. Since no one knew of the threats, much less the existence of a response team, few requests ever came in. Troy Wade, who now commands NEST for the Department of Energy, talks about those early years of development. Uh, out of some of the incidents in, in early 1974, it became pretty clear that, that uh, we had the, the only technical expertise available that could deal with other sorts of incidents involving nuclear material, terrorism being one, uh, 
well. But the mission was enough different from the accident thing that it was determined that we ought to put together a separate new capability. Because most nest activities must be handled without public knowledge, their equipment must be disguised. Detection devices can fit into pods attached to nest helicopters. Or they can be built into an ordinary suitcase, a camera bag, or even a woman's purse. The equipment is able to detect and isolate gamma and neutron radiation sources. And it's so refined, it can do so from 10 feet away or from 10,000 feet in the air. Most of the research and development comes from the nuclear weapons design centers, such as Sandia Laboratories near Albuquerque, New Mexico. The government's chief contractor for radiation detection equipment is a company called EG&G, based near the Nevada test site. And the people who volunteer to use this equipment and find improvised nuclear devices come from all over the country. These people who have thus served then and continue to serve today, many of the same people, have other jobs. So their nest activity is, is a collateral duty, if you will. It's, it's not something they do morning, noon, and night. It's, it's, a, it's an, extra, an extra duty. While the people of NEST were still enlarging and improving their system, the number of nuclear threats continued to grow as well. In 1976, the city of Los Angeles was the target. Union Oil received a, uh, an extortion threat that uh, included in the threat uh, the fact that, that, that this person had hidden a nuclear explosive in one of Union Oil's uh, facilities in the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, the FBI called us and NEST was deployed. Uh, we did search over a period of, uh, of 72 hours uh, with radiation detection equipment, several Union Oil facilities in the Los Angeles Basin, uh, ranging from office buildings to refineries. Uh, we did not find anything and uh, so stated to both the Bureau and to Union Oil, uh, it turned out to be a hoax. Every threat has been a hoax, and I think one must be glad of that and hope that it's always a hoax. But because it's a hoax, our search parties in uh, Boston or San Francisco or Spokane didn't find anything because there was nothing to, be, to find. Therefore, our experts in access uh, diagnostics and render safe never played in the game. So General Gates came up with a game, a secret desert exercise called Nest 77. It accomplished two objectives. It proved that Nest could fly off to a remote site and find a nuclear device hidden in difficult terrain. And it proved that the scientists charged with diagnosing and disarming such a device could do their jobs, at least in theory. But what NEST needed now was a real test of its newly developed expertise in transportation, communication, and detection. The Soviet Union would give them that test the following year. Troy came in in uh, early December and said, uh, he said, may I close the door? Troy at that time was my assistant manager for operations. And I said, certainly. And he came over in very hushed tones, said, we've just learned that uh, the Russians have a satellite uh, which is in a wobbly orbit, and it's expected to impact on the Earth. Well, I think my reaction was, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, when is it going to impact? March or April? Oh, I said, no sweat. Well, let's enjoy Christmas. Their estimates were wrong. Cosmos 954, a huge nuclear-powered Soviet space vehicle, began skipping on the Earth's atmosphere in early January scientists around the world began trying to forecast where it would come down, how much deadly radioactivity it would spread, and across how wide an area. The satellite began its final fiery crash to Earth on the morning of January 24, 1978, scattering its radioactive debris across a huge area of northern Canada, the wilderness area called the Northwest Territory. President Carter offered the services of NEST to the Canadian government and the Canadians accepted. 250 NEST team members flew to Edmonton. Uh, it was almost an impossible job because the reentry footprint covered an area of about 15,000 square miles, 30 miles wide and about 500 miles long. So we were indeed searching for a, 
a needle in a haystack in the midst of, uh, of, of winter in the Northwest Territories where, where normal temperatures were, balmy temperatures were below zero, uh, extreme temperatures with the wind chill factor and so on was, got down to uh, uh, minus 100 degrees. This turned out to be the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. I think that for the first 48 hours, we probably lived on adrenaline. Uh, we were excited. I think everybody had a fee, I know I did, and I think it was characteristic of uh, most of us. We're up here on a mission for the United States government, representing our government in an international exercise. By God, we better cut the mustard. We did, over a period of a uh, couple of months, find uh, jointly with the Canadians and with the Canadian scientific community uh, many, many pieces of the satellite ranging in, in size from uh, oh, a small 20-gallon uh, uh, drum, let's say, to uh, thousands of pieces that were the size of buckshot or even pepper. So it was, it was an incredible logistics scientific task in, in extremely harsh weather conditions. By the time they had recovered the worst of the radioactive material, the Nest team had learned more lessons about logistics and preparation. But they had also learned more about themselves. I think that uh, they feel uh, an honest moral responsibility to the country they serve. Perhaps uh, I should have said patriotic. Indeed, they are a patriotic group, uh, morally committed to, to uh, save their fellow man, save their country. An interesting bunch of people. This is a nuclear age, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, people don't like to recognize it. And uh, the people who are NEST volunteers are, are morally challenged when someone either speaks to them about uh, untrue hazards of radiation or would attempt to do something with nuclear material that could hurt other people. So they're, they're morally challenged to, to deal with the issue and they're technically challenged because of their expertise. Each year, nuclear processing plants around the world manufacture thousands of tons of deadly nuclear material. Scientists in some parts of the nuclear community feel that there is already enough weapons-grade material lost or stolen to build dozens of improvised atomic bombs, and that there are thousands of people with the knowledge in hand who could put such a terrifying weapon together. Those are facts. The challenge to Nest is real. This is the National Atomic Museum just outside Albuquerque, New Mexico on Kirkland Air Force Base. The devices you see in this room are nuclear weapons, weapons which have grown steadily more sophisticated and steadily smaller as our knowledge has grown larger. The first nuclear weapon, nicknamed Fat Man, is huge, and it's considered as crude a machine of destruction as the Model T is considered a machine of transportation. Nest scientists agree that an improvised nuclear device, a homemade bomb, would probably be just as crude as this first effort. But it could easily be just as destructive as well. When the first atomic bomb was raised to the top of its tower back in 1945, there were less than a hundred people in the entire world who knew the basic physics of putting together a nuclear device. That exclusive club is no longer exclusive. There are now at least 27,000 people with PhDs in nuclear physics who could conceivably build a bomb. But even an advanced degree is not needed to make a homemade nuclear weapon today. All that's needed is an ability to gather public documents, take out the desired information, and translate that information into hardware. In 1977, a sophomore at Princeton University named John Aristotle Phillips gathered the information and translated it into a design on paper. His paper bomb could not explode, 
but it was powerful enough to jar the scientific community and send a shock through the public as well. There was a point to be made, which was that if John Phillips can design an atomic bomb from publicly available documents, then many people could do a much better job. And inc that includes terrorist groups, possibly criminal organizations, certainly third world countries. And that really the only way to stop a terrorist group from acquiring a nuclear weapon uh, and actually building one uh, is not by attempting to lock up the information or relying on information itself, but rather preventing the plutonium or the uranium, the raw ingredients for nuclear weapons, from falling into the wrong hands. How difficult was it for you to get your hands on the technical information to write your paper? It was easy, uh, and it was too easy. The, the real problem is that uh, there is so much information out there relating to the design and even construction of nuclear weapons. And what I did was, was merely go to the National Technical Information Service, the Library of Congress, and my physics library, Princeton, and check out the books, and in the case of the National Technical Information Service, buy the documents for about 25 bucks. Those books can still be purchased. These are documents bought from the National Technical Information Service for about $60. They detail the early experiments conducted at Los Alamos, and they contain the basic information on how nuclear weapons are built. In 1949, the same year the Soviets exploded their own version of the bomb, a young physicist came to work at Los Alamos. His job was to take the weapons and make them smaller. This is one of the results. This is a nuclear weapon nicknamed Davy Crockett. It weighs 70 pounds. The young physicist was Ted Taylor. I'm sure the numbers of people who could do this if they wanted to do it, that is, acquire the information, is well over the hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world if they wanted to do that. How one constructs an atomic bomb is, uh, is textbook now. Uh, uh, there are a variety of descriptions of, of what a nuclear weapon looks like inside and how it must work in uh, everything from... Uh, the National Archives to uh, Mechanics Illustrated. In the simplest of terms, an atomic bomb is merely a method of compressing enriched uranium or plutonium in on itself until it produces a nuclear chain reaction. In almost all the weapons built since 1945, that method of compression is still the same. A high explosive is formed into shapes, which will, when set off, mash the nuclear material forming the core in all directions at once. When that happens, the material instantly reaches critical mass, and as the atoms inside are blown apart, enormous amounts of energy are given off. But anyone trying to build a homemade bomb faces some huge problems. Uh, translating basics physics knowledge and basics physics ideas into hardware that works is an enormous engineering technical complication that is just not done as easily as a lot of people think it may be, may be or, or, or tell people that it may be. It's just not that easy to do. The most difficult part about it is, is not contaminating yourself in the process of assembling the device. Uh, and that's something that uh, you run a very high risk of doing. So there are some dangers involved. It's not easy. Uh, you need some, some fairly good precision uh, um, equipment, but it's, that equipment can be purchased anywhere. Members of the nuclear emergency search team say that anyone wanting to build an atomic bomb faces an even bigger problem, acquiring the nuclear material, either enriched uranium or plutonium. Back in the 1940s, all the plutonium in the world was contained in a cheap cigar box in the office of one of the element's discoverers. Now, however, thousands of kilograms a year are produced in processing plants, such as this one in South Carolina. Because the amounts produced here are so enormous, there's growing worry over the loss of the deadly substance. I'm concerned about right now, on a day-to-day -day basis, is the slow pilfering of small quantities of this material by an employee who happens to be employed in one of these plants. Uh, and on a it's not noticed because the amount is so small and it falls within the, the, ca the uh, category of mat material unaccounted for, MUF as it's called. Um, and I'm concerned that over a period of six months or a year, enough will be obviously acquired to, to construct a nuclear weapon. Physicist Ted Taylor believes the problem could even be more dangerous. 
He says that the accounting system at any nuclear processing plant is about 1% inaccurate. If that's true, the government's Savannah River plant alone could lose 45 pounds of plutonium each year without knowing about it. 45 pounds is enough to build almost a dozen atomic bombs. General Malin Gates of the Department of Energy disagrees. Uh, I believe that MUF has evolved largely because either of inventory uh, discrepancies, uh, paperwork discrepancies, or because it's in the system somewhere and its identification is very difficult. I don't think that there's been some grand number of kilograms of U-235 or plutonium swiped. I just don't believe that. There is, of course, another method of obtaining enough nuclear material to build a bomb. Several government reports over the past five years have stated that security around nuclear plants is not strong enough, and those plants could be targets for a terrorist attack. Young Joyce called high. Young Joyce called high. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, analysis has been done about penetrating any of these facilities with, a, with an armed, a well-armed terrorist group. Uh, you can, the, the Army has just awakened to the fact that you can penetrate a nuclear weapons uh, depot uh, with a, with a well-organized terrorist group uh, with light munitions uh, and uh, possibly confiscate a nuclear weapon. If you can do that, you can certainly penetrate a civilian plant, and that's only one of the threats. The analysis John Phillips refers to is a study done by the RAND Corporation, a study kept confidential until recently. That study also shows that a terrorist group would escalate to the use of a nuclear weapon if all its other violent acts failed to force political change or attract enough attention. We live among strangers. We walk down city streets, for the most part, going about our daily lives. And yet, for many of us, there's always an underlying tension. Is today the day we fail to beat the crime odds? Last year, here in New York City, there were over 100,000 armed robberies. Over 40,000 people were assaulted. And the New York City Police Department reports that there were over 2,000 bomb threats. In the first six months of last year alone, 45 of those bombs went off. The leaders of the nuclear emergency search team and the FBI believe that sooner or later, a terrorist group or a psychotic working alone will graduate from such incidents as these random bombings using conventional explosives. They believe that sooner or later, an improvised nuclear device will be built and used in a deadly effort to make a political statement extort a large amount of money, or cause mass public hysteria. Buck Ravel heads the FBI's war against terrorist activities. Well, obviously, terrorism is theater. The whole purpose of terrorism is to create a situation that, that holds and attracts the public attention. And there would be nothing that would attract public attention more than a proposed or ostensible nuclear situation. I don't think it's just a threat. I think it's a certainty that a terrorist group in the next uh, five, maybe ten years is going to acquire a nuclear weapon and use it. The main tools of terrorism in the past have been either rapid gunfire, a lot of it, or high explosives. But one can imagine a situation in which the instant recognition they get from high explosives or from gunfire, the instant display of power, of ability to do damage, and therefore to get action in the direction they want. That can be enormously amplified with uh, nuclear weapons. Because the activity of terrorist groups is greater overseas, some scientists are worried that the spread of nuclear technology to foreign countries could provide them with the deadly raw material of such an escalation. Nuclear power plants have been built and are operating in some 25 nations around the world. One byproduct of any nuclear power plant is plutonium, and enriching it to a point where it could be used to make a bomb 
is considered a reasonably simple task. Some of those nations are politically unstable, and some already support terrorist groups secretly. You know, a third world country or any country has something to lose. Um, you've got territory and you've got people there. But let's assume, and this may be a large assumption, let's assume that the leaders in those countries are concerned about the effects of a nuclear war on their own population. Uh, but what do you do with a terrorist group? Someone who has nothing to lose, getting his hands on a nuclear weapon. Uh, how do you bargain with someone like that? You don't. Uh, if they are sponsored by a state, and some terrorist groups are, uh, the likelihood increases. Uh, at this point, I don't think it is a strong possibility, but it, it increases each year, and uh, it gives us more concern. Most people agree that what has kept the world out of nuclear violence with nuclear weapons has been the whole concept of deterrence. You do that to us, we'll do that to you. What do you do when attacked by terrorists or by a country that, uh, a small country particularly, that has its back to the wall and has nothing to lose. It's already been bombed. Uh, deterrence doesn't work. You can't bomb a city to retaliate against some uh, terrorist group that's perhaps just organized for that purpose. They may be in, uh, in your own city. So when it's, if one says that deterrence has kept nuclear weapons from exploding, then any route to the use of nuclear explosives in which deterrence fails becomes a new and, I would say, generally more serious danger. It is, it is very dangerous. The plant that was in Iraq uh, was being used for bomb building purposes. There is no doubt about that. The technology which was sold to Pakistan, uh, it was uh, being used for bomb building purposes. No one disputes that. Uh, the Libyans have been financing uh, the development and acquisition of a, uh, I think it's been called an Islamic bomb. Uh, it's fact. The South Africans, the Israelis, uh, both have nuclear weapons now. Um, if the South Africans don't have one, they're at most a year away. So there are about 12, I would say, uh, third world countries that are on the verge of acquiring nuclear uh, weapons themselves, and maybe another two dozen that are uh, perhaps 10 years away. Ten years ago, there was trouble here at home. This country was being shaken by acts of violence, violence created by Americans against Americans. No one is certain that those explosive protests won't start again in future years. The nuclear emergency search team was created when the memory of that purely American terror was still fresh. And those in charge of NEST are concerned that the next explosive protests could be nuclear. They also worry about the lone psychotics who allow their private anger to detonate in violence against people they don't even know. Knowing that the threat is there and the technology is available, is there reason for us to be afraid? Afraid, no. Concerned, yes. Obviously, once the potential is there, and obviously the potential is there, then we would be very imprudent not to be concerned enough to plan and to take precautions. But I certainly don't go home at night worrying about a nuclear incident myself, and I would hope that the public would not eat. Even so, the FBI and NEST are prepared. In a moment, we'll show you for the first time how these people would handle a real nuclear threat in a major American city. Well, that, of course, would be the ultimate terror. That would be the one in which we pulled all the stops. A spring day begins in the city of New York. Eight million people go to work, read the newspaper, fight the traffic, and go about their lives. In his office at City Hall, the mayor of New York reads a letter. Somewhere in his city, a nuclear weapon has been hidden. A detailed diagram of that weapon accompanies the note. The weapon is a plutonium bomb. The letter carefully lists a set of demands. If those demands are not met, Manhattan will be leveled. Eight million people will die. This is not a hoax. The mayor calls the police department. The police call in the FBI. 
the investigation begins. Now, there will be a great deal of internal intelligence collection to try and formulate the best estimate that we can as to the bona fides of the note, any background on the group, and so forth. Before agents hit the street or police officers hit the street, we're going to have to know a lot more than probably that note gives us right up front. Uh, so it would be unlikely that you'd see, uh, if you were standing outside the FBI office, uh, uh, a group of 100 agents running and getting into to squad cars and peeling off. On the third floor of the FBI headquarters in Washington, a special room is activated, the FBI's emergency center. It will soon be staffed by agents of the Criminal Investigation Division who will coordinate the information being received from the New York office. And the FBI will make a call to the Department of Energy. Range operation center. When the FBI makes that call, it rings here. This is the Department of Energy's emergency operations center, buried in the Maryland countryside, 25 miles from the White House. The duty officers immediately begin gathering all of the resources of knowledge available to NEST. Experts in the fields of nuclear physics, engineering, meteorology, medicine, and communication begin gathering in this room. Other NEST team members begin their journey to the city. The first group to go would uh, likely have gone from a group at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, and they probably probably would have flown uh, to New York City. At the same time, we're loading aircraft in Las Vegas to come to New York. Arrangements would have been made already by the FBI as to where would be the most convenient place to land and where could we set up our headquarters. I'm, I'm satisfied the FBI would have made that determination. A gymnasium or uh, a warehouse, an unused warehouse or something like that, a large facility where we could accumulate a lot of people and uh, set up uh, our offices and our workplaces and our warehousing to, to unload all our equipment. Uh, it wouldn't be long once we arrived till the search actually was undertaken. Meanwhile, the experts look over the diagram to find out if the threat is real. We would set into motion uh, a, a threat assessment network that we have developed jointly with the FBI, uh, wherein the, the, the contents of the message would be uh, dissected and very closely examined by a variety of people from a variety of walks of life. The FBI sends the original note to the Washington headquarters to begin two examinations, a study of its forensic contents, such as fingerprints, typeface, and the kind of paper it's written on, and a psycholinguistic study to help draw a profile of who wrote the message. The first stop in the Washington labs is the photography center, where a permanent record of the note is made, a record which could be used as evidence later. Then the original note would be sent to our identification division. There they would utilize the laser technique to try and raise any latent fingerprints. Uh, we would, of course, anyone who's handled the note, we would have elimination prints and we would try and determine if it, this is an unknown fingerprint. If it is an unknown fingerprint, we have certain special files we can go to to try and identify the perpetrator. In New York City, despite the enormous threats surrounding them, New Yorkers are unaware of the danger. The public will not be notified. The media will not be alerted. Panic and uh, any type of um, hysterical reaction could be much more dangerous than any plausible device. And that might well be the, the intended target, was public uh, hysteria. Everything the Nest team sees and records in the field can be instantly displayed on these monitors here in the Emergency Operations Center. Computers in another part of the center analyze that data. And the people who sit in these chairs explore possibilities, make decisions, and send back orders to the scientists and technicians in the field. The cumulative knowledge of all we know about nuclear energy is at times represented in this room. This is the heart of Nest. Nest team members will fly selected patterns over the city, looking for what they call a hot spot, a location somewhere in those streets where the radioactive levels are higher than normal. There is a device on the helicopter uh, which is connected to both the uh, gamma and neutron pods. And uh, if there is some radioactive source emitting neutrons or gamma rays, uh, our equipment would pick that up. If he flew over uh, 
a more precise source of radiation, he would get a, a blip on his screen and he would be able to pinpoint that, that I just flew over the corner of Market and 22nd and I got a blip. So somebody on the ground would go to Market and 22nd. <laughs> Unmarked nest vans on the ground, then head to the hotspot area, traveling slowly along nearby streets, looking at similar detection screens. As they focus in on the radiation source, men on foot begin circling the suspected area. They carry their detection systems quietly in briefcases or other disguise containers. Slowly, the circle is tightened. The FBI finds and arrests those who built the device. And Nest Team members confront the weapon itself. Time will be the biggest unknown, but Nest feels confident they can zero in on that single source of radiation and find the device. When that happens, Nest will face its biggest challenge, making the weapon safe. Years of research, years of simulation exercises will then be used to disarm the weapon, using methods so secret only a handful of Nest scientists have been cleared for that knowledge and that job. Recent events in this country have shown that there is a tendency for some to copy violent crimes against people. Now that the threat of nuclear terrorism is known, the men who lead the fight against such crimes have a warning for those who might attempt to try it. One is concerned that uh, by spreading this kind of information uh, hither and yon, uh, some person will, uh, of less than uh, even mentality, will look at that and say, oh, I'm going to test that out there and see how good they are. Uh, we don't want that to happen. It's, it's the type reaction of the false alarm, the person who puts in the false alarm to see how fast the fire department can get there. It's, it's the ridiculous extreme of our society. That's the danger. Well, that would be a very hazardous undertaking. Uh, without question, their chances of getting away with it are almost nil. Uh, this agency and others would expend limitless resources until we solve such a situation. And it just would not be a very wise move on anybody's part. It's not the type of crime that's going to happen and be forgotten. Once apprehended, those who attempt nuclear terrorism are charged with full violation of the Atomic Energy Act even if there's no actual nuclear material involved. The maximum penalty, life in prison. There's a tendency, I believe, to, to view with some special consideration individuals that get involved in this type because of the potential for panic and, and tremendous public disruption. So I believe that uh, the judges take some special note and that there's a tendency to be somewhat more severe in these type cases, even though they are 100% uh, hoax. We have experienced, we, the uh, American public, or indeed the public of the world at large, over the period of the past five, six, seven years, an increase in terrorism. Uh, one never knows when it's going to strike, who it's going to strike, how it will be perpetrated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I indicated earlier I thought there was a possibility, remote in my view, but a possibility of somebody uh, being able to make uh, an in improvised nuclear device. I think we have to recognize that there is that possibility, that there are terrorists, there are those who are anti-government of one type or another. But I'm satisfied that uh, given the degree of difficulty of that uh, kind of uh, exercise occurring, and given the, uh, the strength of the uh, of the government from the point of view of the nuclear emergency search capability. My judgment, uh, Jackson, is that we're safe.
What began 38 years ago as a flash of light across the New Mexico desert has generated countless arguments in the years since. Those arguments over the benefits or dangers of nuclear technology play no role in this story. Nuclear technology exists, and as long as it does, there will always be the potential that it may be used for good or evil. The nuclear emergency search teams exist as well. You may never see the results of a successful nest operation on your nightly newscast. You will know when they fail. I'm Jackson Bain.